Hey, my name is Gerwin. And my name is Sean. This is the Sick Meets World podcast, where we have conversations with powerful six who took on the world around them. We are also the leaders of the National Sick Campaign, the organization that started the award-winning We Are Six initiative, which aim to help the broader American public understand our values and contributions to the United States. And over the years, while we're developing the campaign, we had an opportunity to meet and have in-depth conversations with so many amazing six. And we often thought, man, like if other people could listen in on these conversations and gain some of these insights, it would be super beneficial. We believe this podcast is an opportunity to finally do just that. We hope that when you listen to these conversations, that you will be inspired and become engaged in your community, and ultimately in public service. Exactly. In fact, the National Sick Campaign, and ultimately Sick Meets World, were in response to the shooting in Oak Creek, Wisconsin in 2012. That tragic event showed that the troubles of our community and lack of knowledge of Sikhism generally continued to persist far after 9-11. So, for our first episode, we chat with fellow activists who were also motivated to action after Oak Creek, Pradeep Singh Kaleka and Arno McCallis. Pradeep's father, Satwant Singh, was the president of the Oak Creek Gurdwara and heroically died while trying to stop the shooter. And Arno, he's a former white supremacist who actually started the same white power group that the Oak Creek shooter was a part of. After Oak Creek, they forged an unlikely friendship that they detail in their new book, the gift of our wounds. In this episode, Gerwin got to join them along their book tour in New York City to discuss how their paths crossed. Please take a listen to the first episode of Sick Meets World. I I was reading the book. I was on the plane. It was just so freaking good. Thanks, man. Yeah, my eyes would well up at moments. When I would listen to Pardeep's story, this serene kind of like humming life, I mean, there's obviously ups and downs, but it's very serene in the sense that there is there's a lot there was a lot of clarity yeah. of like where where you needed to go and achieving that and the struggles of that, and I I could relate to it a lot. Then you would have this hard break, and it would go to Arno, and it was just chaotic and it was messy, and I would cringe. I could relate to it if I took certain elements of my personality and just brought them to the most extreme expressions of that. Yeah, yeah. And surprisingly, I, I understood it. I could not see myself doing those things. Right. But again, I could see the most, the most extremes expression of myself in a certain realm going to that place. Right on. But anyway, <laughs> let's actually talk about like why we're here. So you guys have an epic friendship. Do you want to tell folks how it got started? Yeah, yeah. No, um, yeah, and I wanted to actually comment on a lot of that stuff, but we'll come back to that in a little bit. Yeah. Our, our friendship got started uh, shortly after... Uh, the shootings at the Sikh Temple of Wisconsin in Oak Creek um, on August 5th, 2012, when six people lost their lives. Uh, one of those people being my father, Sikh Temple President Satwan Singh Kalika, uh, at the hands of a white supremacist uh, gunman. Uh, and, and about a couple months later, reached out to Arno just to ask him, and I knew that he was doing this work already, so just to ask him, like, you know, uh, what, what, what was the motivation behind it? I mean, like you said, Guru, it's tough to, like, you, you even said, like, you can understand it. And a lot of times we don't get into that, like, we, we judge before we understand. So I didn't want to be, I didn't want to be at fault of doing that. Mm-hmm. So that was my inspiration of reaching out to Arno. Mm-hmm. And from there, um, just, a, just a beautiful friendship. Um, uh, I mean, we, we, we both kind of went there for our own purposes, mm-hmm. but I feel like, um, uh, sometimes what you what you want and what you what you get are two different things. Yeah. And what we got out of that was a, was a beautiful friendship. Yep. For me, August fifth, twenty twelve, like brought a new urgency to the work I was doing. I came public with my story in two thousand ten, and the intention was really to make the world a place that's less conducive to hate and violence, uh, to help guide people away from the mistakes that I made, to help people of all backgrounds 
find healthy ways to resolve conflicts rather than violence. And I've been doing that work uh, with a with a zeal for a couple of years, but it wasn't until the August fifth shooting that, like, I think the real urgency of it became apparent. Like, this is a guy who came from the gang that I had helped to start. I had literally like set the stage for this guy. And so I felt a lot of responsibility that I had to respond. I had to be part of the the defiance of hate and violence in, in response to this atrocity that happened. So I was I was really honored to uh that Parr reached out to me and I was really excited when I first heard from him and, and uh happy to help any way I could and really just offering that help and, and being there was, was what was most important. But I, I was pretty freaked out also. Really? Yeah. Like I, I, I was intimidated at the prospect by meeting him because I just felt like there was nothing I could say that would be sufficient. Right. Like just coming in there like, Hey, I'm Arnold. Sorry about your dad. Like it just sounded utterly hollow. And, right. and not enough. Like there's, I'm a pretty wordy dude. Right. <laughs> like, it's, it's probably apparent already. Yeah. Uh, and I, I'm the same way when I write. So yeah. like I'm, I'm very verbose. Mm-hmm. And um, being at a loss for words is is an odd situation for me. And so I I, I was at a loss as as to what to say to party when I met him. Yeah. I wanted you to touch on your dad a little bit because there's so many moments where you wrote about your dad. Yeah. That made. My like I, my eyes welled up because it was like it reminded me of what my family had to go through. Yeah, and he 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 embodied what it meant to be a sick up up until the literal moment that he passed away. Yeah. Like that, yeah. there was no more. I don't want to say the sick way to pass away, but more like like the way you think of a of, of what a sick is supposed to do. Yeah. Right. I uh, think about yeah. Um, yeah. Like up until the moment he died. Yeah. Sure. I'll uh, share. Um. So like even though the, we're doing our best to put on a brave face for the world because right. that's right. our responsibility right. and obligation. Um. And I, I remember just the day of the funeral mm. comes up, and uh, we go and we're at the where you know we're we're putting dad's body away, mm. and uh, I decide that I decide that I'm just gonna I'm gonna walk home. And people are like, you know, they're kind of concerned because they're like, well, I don't know where he is. And I just asked them, and my, my my wife was, you know, amazing in this because she always has her trust in me, and uh, she just, uh, you know, tells me like, if he wants to walk home, let him walk home. And so I walked home, kind of cleared my head, um, just got through a, a lot of just processing. And once I got home, that's exactly what um, a lot of family told me that there's no better way to die than to be inside the place that you helped build that that you were president of for the past 15 years with, you know, a, a knife in your hand against a, a gunman trying to protect your place. And it, it really symbolizes and brings back, and I'm not comparing him to, you know, I'm not comparing it to the Golden Temple or an Amritsar, and I'm not comparing that to, you know, Baba Deep Singh and things like that. But in the spirit of uh, defying hate, you know, Baba Deep Singh held, you know, the story is he held his head in one hand and his sword in the other and fought off invaders mm-hmm. and and i th- i think in that spirit that there yeah there's no better way for a sick to be um martyred mm-hmm. and for, uh, but um you know his life was uh, the same sacrifice that he gave that same day it, it was and I, this is for sick and immigrants who come over and they sacrifice so much so that we can lead a better life um he was just yeah he was just that way and it was on, honestly it was my honor to to put him in in that in the book and him have such a big part of that book um Siki, we um you know feel like the the spiritual belief of Siki um comes in where we see like this 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 spirit that is within everybody and once we leave this leave this earth we leave this body this soul leaves us and returns back and merges to wherever it merges to. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, through the past five and a half, six years after this, I, I believe that those spirits, all, you know, all of those spirits that we have lost have been guiding us to do what we had to do. And things would, um, I wouldn't worry about things uh, going right or going wrong. 
I just know they had to go the way that they were going to go. Mm-hmm. So th- this 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 book was, you know, a testament to all mm-hmm. all those spirits. Yeah. The the other thing, I guess, another question I wanted to ask is, you were you were actually an immigrant here. Mm-hmm. Like I, I I was born here, mm-hmm. and it's a very different experience. Yeah. What was that like? So um, <clears throat> I was and how a, yeah. and how has the U.S. changed from when you moved here to now? We came in uh, 1982. And during that time, we, you know, we moved from Patiala, Punjab. Um, Patiala, Punjab, I mean, was having its share of problems, uh, like instituted curfews and things like that. And it's documented in the book. And this was before um, Operation Blue Star um, happened. And then, um, you know, the, the Sikh Hindu riots of that time. So we definitely, once we came here, we felt the sense of, I know Dad felt the sense of guilt of not being back in his homeland. But he also felt this sense of relief, right? And that's a funny feeling because I think even after the shooting happened and I was safe, I felt the sense of guilt and I felt the sense of relief. Like, thank God I'm not dead, mm-hmm. but oh my God, I got to do something about it. Um, and uh, when we came to America, it was, it was, yeah, Milwaukee, Milwaukee, Wisconsin was just completely different. It was very much a manufacturing blue collar uh, beer town. Uh <laughs> There wasn't a lot of opportunities for immigrants to get get jobs, so you really had to look after one another. So the first uh, first job that Dad got was working at a gas station um, for a friend of his, and then the first job that Mom got was working at a uh, knitting plant uh, in downtown Milwaukee. And those jobs at that time paid, I think, like a dollar fifty an hour, and uh, really just owning gas stations at that time was not really. A profitable or lucrative career that anybody wanted to do um but he stuck in there and uh, eventually just uh was able to buy his first gas station um and fix it up uh it was a, it was an old mechanic cr- uh garage and and uh you know in a traditionally south side neighborhood um that had all, also gone through demographic change um and becoming much more from a going from a polish neighborhood to becoming a latino neighborhood and uh you know we, we weren't latino we weren't polish you know one of the one of the weird things is like when i was growing up i was never really anything to be anything enough like i was never i was never white enough to be white i was never black enough to be black i was never latino enough to be latino i was never really like and there wasn't enough six around yep. to be to be that either yeah so it was like the first time that i really started to hang out with six and indians was in college right yeah so same yeah, so it was just a really different world um, than the one that we have now. You had like multiple faces. Whoa, yeah, yeah. multiple, multiple. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I can definitely identify that. But I, I, I want to get to Arno because that I think a lot of people are going to get a lot of. As much as people again, as much as people will identify with Pradeep when they read the book, I think people will just be endlessly curious about Arno because. You grew up. You you actually had a fairly fairly decent childhood. Oh um, yeah, yeah. It wasn't obviously perfect, but it was solid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But how, so how how did you? Can you describe how you got onto the path of becoming a white supremacist? The we do <clears throat> we do a lot of workshops, training, and and one of them that's basically a, a, an exercise in compassion, exploring mm-hmm. compassion, understanding it, cultivating it. The theme is hurt people hurt people. Yes. The, the, the essence of where violence comes from. And in my case, in my childhood was idyllic I, in, in many, many ways. There, there are literally billions of children on the face of this earth who would have happily traded childhoods with me. They, it would have been like winning the lottery for them to trade childhoods right. with me. Uh, a lot of it, I think, has to do with my personality type. I'm, I, I don't know, party probably has many diagnoses for me, <laughs> but like from, the, from day one, I, I was like this weird, wild, different kid. I, I was an adrenaline junkie. Like I needed to have insane, like out of the box stimulation going on just to keep me interested in anything. Right. And that it wasn't for lack of trying that that wasn't guided in a good way. Um, <clears throat> my mom is, a, is an absolutely brilliant artist and I was drawing things from day one and I've always been really involved in one kind of pursuit or the arts or another. 
Um, unfortunately, that didn't guide me in a good direction, really. It, it wasn't, it was just kind of taken for granted along with all the other things I took for granted. Yeah. I had a lot of uh, adults in my life who really cared about me. All Every teacher I ever had was just like, he's so bright. He's such a wonderful kid. Like, But then they're asking, why is he doing this? Why does he act like this? I grew up in an alcoholic household. My dad's drinking put a lot of pressure on my mom. And they fought a lot. It, it it was never physical violence. Um, it, it it was never even like really heated arguments. It was just my mom being stressed to her absolute breaking point constantly. Right. And um, and and my dad's an amazing person. He he loved us uh, deeply, and we knew that every right. single day. But that distance that alcoholism creates between the alcoholic and the rest of their people in their life is that hurt me that hurt my mom. Um, and I, looking back, I think it was my suffering growing up in that environment, which drove me to start lashing out at other kids. Yeah. And I started getting a thrill from not only lashing at other kids, but mostly from the response I got from all these adults. Right. And it, another kind of like way to distill it is that, I was my entire life. I've been told how wonderful I am and how gifted I am. And I just, because I was suffering, I was like, you know, I'm not wonderful. Right. I'm horrible. If you don't believe me, watch what I'm going to do to this kid. Right. And then I, I would bully kids and they would still say, no, you're still wonderful. And I'd be like, okay, you don't believe me still. Right. I'm going to have to like turn up the horrible a little bit right. until you right. do believe me. Right. And it, 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 I, I don't know you know, what I, I was hoping to accomplish. I don't, I, I'm not saying like there's any kind of end point, but right. it, this is just basically, it's what suffering does. It, it, right. it distances you. It, it, we as human beings have a tendency, we're animals like other animals. And when right. an animal is hurt, a cat or a dog, they have a tendency to go like isolate themselves, right. crawl off in a corner under a porch somewhere. And human beings do that also. Yes. And, and so my way of isolating myself was just to disengage from my parents, both my parents who really, for all their struggles, they really tried to keep me on a good track. They put everything they had into uh, giving me a good life and, and keeping me headed in a good direction, as did all these teachers, as did all these relatives. Yep. And it still just got, it just snowballed as I grew older. My antisocial behavior just kept amplifying to the point where I started drinking when I was 14. First time I drank, I drank till I passed out. Do, do you think it was, do you think it amplified because of the, you were addicted to the, to the emotion of just reveling in the chaos of your anger? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Th that was my addiction for sure. And, uh, I, I felt a sense of power from it. Right. It, and it, it wasn't because, it, it's important to say, it wasn't because I didn't feel powerful as it was. Like, I had the world, like, fawning over me about what a golden boy I was. And, and that's certainly a sense of power. Right. Like, it, it, in society, I, I was born into a position of power. But I didn't see it that way. I, I saw power as people being afraid of me. At, or, or, and, or, like, it, it people, like, respecting me because other people were afraid of me. Like, it, it was that kind of... Dynamic. False respect that that's that's rooted in fear, right. and so started drinking. When I was fourteen. I was super into punk rock, which I still love. Um, I don't think punk itself was like the problem, but for me, it was just a vehicle to lash out at the world, to break stuff, to make people angry. And uh, when I was sixteen, is when I was introduced to white power skinhead music, and that to me was just like the ultimate means of repulsing people. It was the ultimate way to make people angry, to to and, and it was the ultimate way to say I'm horrible. Right, right. It, it almost feels like it was like if you take the idea of like when you're arguing with somebody, and you come back and you're like, and another thing, you know what I mean? <laughs> right, yeah, but that yeah. to be the most extreme expression of that. Totally. But yeah, like, that's like, a your, good way to put your, it. like your your whole life was revolved around going and another thing. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Um, that that's when when I first heard you say that, like that's how I understood. Yeah, I was like, it, it is actually not. It may not even really the philosophy of, the, of of white supremacy is almost not even what drove you. It was, it was this addiction to this chaos, 
And that was just an outlet that you hung your hat on mm-hmm. to achieve that chaos. Is that accurate? Yeah, you nailed it. That that's exactly what it was. It, it, had I <laughs> yeah, good, good, nice one, girl. Um, had I seen some other vehicle right. to repulse people that was more effective than a swastika, right. I would have been all over it. Right. Um, I just it, and and some kids do find other vehicles that they they feel like, hey, I'm really I'm a rebel. Right. I'm rebelling against societies, and, and nowadays the, the alt right is full. The Tea Party was all like that, as, as are these same elements on the left. Right, like I'm resisting. I'm I'm resisting this. I'm fighting against this, and and it's. I, I think all kids, especially, and all human beings, do to a degree, but especially when you're a teenager, you want to make a difference. You want to change things. You want to make an impact. Yep. And what drives people into any flavor of violent extremism is a a lack of identity, purpose, and belonging. Yeah. Just about every violent extremist you talk to, you go, why are you doing this? They're going to say, because this is happening and it, this is bad, it needs to change. I need to stop this bad thing from happening. Yep. So it, it is like this twisted kind of sense of altruism. Um. <laughs> but honestly, to me, like that, that again, that was arbitrary. That right. was part of my vehicle to make people angry was that oh, I'm saving the white race. I'm fighting against the, the genocide against the white race. Yep. And like, yeah, that's all well and good for the whole neo-Nazi narrative. But for me, if that didn't anger people, I wouldn't have been interested in it. Right. And that's totally, totally how it felt when I was, when I read the book. And then I want to take it. A- to Pradeep, he's almost similar in your life at that point. You were trying to find purpose in 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 in, in being a police officer. Um, what was it like trying to to serve and then not being able to have the opportunity to to do that? Yeah, no, it was uh, you. You hit it right on the head. It's just uh, oftentimes, and and I, I went to a great university. Um, you know, uh, did well, and then applied to multiple police departments. Um, and really just not getting those callbacks made me kind of think, um, damn, like, uh, what, what else do I got to do to be like, even have a shot right. to be, to be on this police department. Right. Um, yeah, just got passed up by, you know, just numerous police departments. And I remember going and taking the test and thinking to myself, wow, this is like the written test. Like, right. This is easy. Yeah. I went, I left in like 20 minutes cause I'm like, this is so easy. Yep. And then not getting a call back. I mean, like, wow, it was so easy. I know I did well on it. Right. And still not getting a call back. And I got a four-year degree when it's only required to have, like, a high school degree at the time. Yeah. Or a two-year degree. Yeah. And so you're like, like, you knew you could, <laughs> it was clear you could do the work. Yeah. So yeah. it took work just to not even be disgruntled at that. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, eventually, you know, was thankful that uh, um, Milwaukee came uh, calling and, uh, you know, went through the process. It was, it was a long process. Became a police officer, went to the academy for nine months, uh, then finally out to the streets. And then really just, uh, you know, I'm from Milwaukee, but where I was policing was was the inner city of Milwaukee. And really just, you know, 99% of my arrests were um, violent crimes, domestics, guns, drugs, um, and... and, um, you know, just getting used to that culture mm-hmm. of policing, and and so there's there's a couple of different, um, you know, we're wearing masks, right? Mm-hmm. So you're you're wearing a mask when you get to the when you get to the job. Yep. Then you take that mask off, and we call it well, it might, it might not be exactly a mask, but it might be a bulletproof vest, right? And it might be a gun, and it might be a badge, and it might be all those things that you carry on yourself mm-hmm. to like, hey, you know what? I'm gonna be secure when I go out there. Mm-hmm. Um, and hopefully like when you get home, you can take that off. And, uh, I just really knew it was time for me to, to stop policing when I was getting angry, you know, just breathe me and me and Preeti we were, uh, uh, married and we had Amherst was on the way mm-hmm. and, uh, Preeti would ask me, um, you know, how was, how was work? Mm-hmm. And then she would ask me like every once in a while, how's work, how's work? And I never really answered, but then one time I answered and I said, listen, if I got to explain to you how work was, then I got to relive it. Mm-hmm. And then I got to go through it twice. So why right. would I want to do that? Right. And then once you can't even talk about what you're doing, 
um, and you know, it's probably time to change careers. Right, right, right. I want to, I want to go back to Arno. So wh- you touched on a lot of things about how you became a white supremacist, you know, why you got into, swept into that ideology. Like, I, I have a couple of questions just out of curiosity and then I have like some more serious ones. Sure. Like, what, how, how did you... How did you deal with that level of chaos? Because there's like some things that you did when I was reading the book that I just like cringed. Like the stuff when you were like in the in your parents' home when you found out they were away. Yeah. And like or when you saw the gay the gay the gay gentleman there's a gay gentleman that you had punched. Right. Like how did you how did you like I, I was just like, Oh my god, the humanity is just like just had escaped. Yeah. How how did you get to that that place? I because I guess that's another that's a different level. It was really just a matter of like being in constant flight of what just happened. Like whatever just happened five minutes ago, I gotta get away from it. I gotta I can't sit here literally and figuratively. <laughs> I, I can't be here w- when everything comes shaken down right. when the consequences of this arrive. Right. And I'd say that whether it was a crime I was committing and the consequences were the police coming or, and and really most powerfully, I I can't escape my own inner consequences. Like throughout me, there's this, throughout that process, there's a human being inside of me who's going, what are you doing? Right. What is wrong with you? Like this is, this is horrible. You shouldn't be doing this. Right. And so I'm constantly trying to flee that voice. So the way I managed the chaos was to be constantly in motion, whether it was physically, emotionally, intellectually. No, I wasn't in an intellectual motion, that's for sure. But spiritually, I I wasn't even thinking on those levels. I'm just trying to flee the, the intellectual and spiritual consequences of what I'm doing. And I, I'm always really tentative to... to even mention alcohol because I, I never ever want to make it sound like, an, Oh, I was just drunk. Like right. that's, it's, it's never an excuse. The, the alcoholism was, the, there's plenty of alcoholics on earth. Very, excuse me, plenty of alcoholics on earth. Like I fortunately not many of them attack people because of the color of their skin. Right. Uh, but the alcohol was certainly a factor. That was part of my way of fleeing. I was, I was constantly like numbing, this inner voice that was saying, this is bad. So I'm like, oh, well, if I drink enough beer, then I'm not going to hear that voice anymore. Mm. I was wondering how you, because there's that voice that people have. When they yeah, like, absolutely. When they do something bad and they know they're doing something bad and there's a consequence coming and they eventually have to deal with their inner voice and the consequence together. Yep. And I was wondering, I was like, how, I was like, if I put myself in your shoes, I was like, how could I live with just myself, just forget the consequences. Right. If I was doing this, because I know this voice would be there just ripping me apart. Right, right. And I, so it was, it was alcoholism that allowed you to numb that. The alcohol is a huge, huge part of it. That was yeah. my go-to. That was it, every day. I, it was basically like, how am I going to get beer? Where's the beer coming from? How much can I drink? And then what, how do I, I balance that with work, which is how I get more beer. Like that was that was really a, one of the the biggest front and center concerns of mine. But another means of fleeing was delving into the ideology of white supremacy. I.e., there's a chapter in the book where I, I travel down south, and there, there's actually like a holiday in uh, white supremacist circles called Martyrs Day, which is the day that. A guy named Robert Matthews was killed by federal agents on Whidbey Island in Seattle. Yeah, that guy was that guy <clears throat> died an insane death. I, he it was hardcore. Like yeah. he, he, it was him versus like about a hundred federal agents yeah. who were all heavily. It was out of a movie, like yeah, straight yes. up out of a movie. And this dude, when he died, was burnt to to a crisp, holding his rifle. Exactly. Like that is that is committed <laughs> well, it is. It, yeah. it's it, it, and that's real that, yeah. that really happened right now for me in the way that that would be a means of flight for me is i would think of robert matthews 
and the sacrifice that he made, you know, dying with his, his hands on, on his weapon and never giving up. Like, so in my head, I'm thinking like, I gotta be like this guy. But I, I, I knew damn well that I, I, did not, I didn't really want to get in a firefight with federal agents and I didn't want to, I, I, I didn't have the, the guts to take it that far. I don't know that guts is the right word, but I, I, Robert Matthews was certainly a different type of white supremacist than me. Robert Matthews didn't drink. He was like 100% ideology mental driven. clarity all yeah. the time. And he right. was so engulfed in, in the lies of white supremacy. He believed them to be true. And he was, he was as hardcore as you get, but like going to a ceremony where we're, we're swearing allegiance to the, the fight that he kicked off and you know, all these like, and at that ceremony, I was relatively sober. Yeah. So it, it was it was the ideology compared combined with the alcohol, combined with the the white power music, the fighting, the violence. That was all means of of flight to to not like sit and just dwell in what was happening and what what I was doing and why I was doing it. I I never wanted to answer any of those questions. Yeah. Um. How, how did you get out of it? exhaustion is the simple answer that everything that was, it wasn't even actually what you like we got going back to what we said earlier it wasn't even what you really the ideology wasn't really what was motivating you it, it the, yeah. everywhere you looked blew holes in the ideology like it, everything it, especially the the biggest driver of the exhaustion is when people who i claim to hate treated me with kindness yeah. and so the ideology says that uh, there's this Jewish conspiracy to wipe the white race off the face of the earth. It's been going on for thousands of years. And as their greatest weapon against us are people of color. So black people, Latino people, Indian people, whoever, anybody who's not white, they're here because of the Jews bringing them here. Mm-hmm. Like that, this is all like white power ideology 101. And when I had a Jewish boss who said I was a good kid just going through a phase rather than fire me for having a swastika on my jacket, that blew holes in this whole thing about how Jews are these horrible people. Like, yeah. this guy is, is a human being, and he's a very uh, honorable one to the point where he's like, yeah, whatever, He, I know. He's, go ahead, yeah, yeah. you <laughs> white power, see Kyle, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, you know, you'll grow out of it. <laughs> yeah. he, he, and this is... Someone who who has family members who perished in the Holocaust, like this, is someone who had every every reason to to hate me and and to fire me with a vengeance, and and he didn't uh, take that path. He he took the path of humanity and demonstrated for me how human beings should treat each other, yes. and that knowledge of that experience was just like this. Uh, it just added to the. If, if you picture it, like you're walking, actually. Part of we used to do this, we, <laughs> sometimes when we do talks, we'd, we'd bring a, a kid up to the front of, of the audience and we'd put like a, a jug of water in their hand that was maybe full about like this. Yeah. And, and Par would like slowly pour water in the jug, making it heavier and heavier while talking to the audience. Yeah. And as it gets heavy, you see this kid like now they're, it's hard to keep it holding it up and, yep. not, and they get to a point where they're breaking. Yeah. They can't hold it up anymore. Yep. And again, the reason of this exercise is to get the audience to be like, "Hey, why are you making him do that? Don't don't do that! Like it's getting heavy. Can't you yep. see he's struggling?" Yep. For me, it was like I'm carrying around these jugs that are getting more and more full of water and weight. Right. And every time somebody treats me with kindness, that's like a huge addition to the weight that I'm carrying. Right. To till it gets to the point where I'm like, I I can't carry the weight anymore. I I just have to shed it. Yes. And so that's what brought me to the point. I was looking for an excuse to leave after being in for seven years. The excuse came in a two-stage process. I became a single parent when my daughter was eighteen months old. What What is your opinion on the on the on the state of the the white power movement today? Because when Oak Creek happened, when I heard a white supremacist did that, I was like, man, I was like, what the hell? Like, it was right. like how many of these people are still around? Right. Yeah, I know they're around, but like, let's be real, like, how many of these people are still around? Right. Um, but now it, it's it's shifted. So if you're like in high school or college listening to this, 
10 years ago, just five years ago, it's not common to hear about these people, but now they're in the news right. again. So how, what, what, in your raw opinion, what is your, how do you theorize the, the emergence of these groups? And a question for both of you guys from your experience, what's the best way to meet that level of hatred? Uh, and that, you know, level of extremism. What's happening now is the rhetoric coming from the White House is like dead on rhetoric that we used to use in the day. Close the borders. Immigrants are bad. They're rapists. Yep. They're terrorists. Yep. We don't want them in our country. We're going to kick them out. Uh, all of that rhetoric is like white power 101. That, that That's... People on the right will say, well, that's guilt by association to associate the Klan with, with Donald Trump. But when you and your talking points are exactly the same, right? That it's it's just, it's a fact. It, there's, yep. You can't deny that all that comes from Donald This is a guy who wanted to have a, and I don't know if this actually took off, but he was going to have like a weekly thing highlighting immigrant crime yep. against some, you know, innocent American. It's just that... It, it's you never want to go there to like oh Hitler okay conversation's over right but but looking at what happened in Nazi Germany and having studied the Holocaust to a, a fair degree myself like you see all these parallels happening right the the xenophobia the us versus them yes we're Americans they're not um, Americans exactly yes. it, it's a very ripe environment for. Uh, white supremacist groups. They feel sanctioned. They they feel validated yep. by the highest office in the land. Yep. At the same time, there there's pretty critical differences going on that uh, I wouldn't have been cool with back in the day. And I think a lot of white supremacists like aren't. They just try to gloss over. But that that being, if you're a person of color, if you're anybody in you know a marginalized group. But you want to come in there and wear a "Make America Great Again" hat, and you want to condemn. Mexicans and Muslims and uh, say that Black Lives Matter are terrorists, which there are black people who do that. There's right. Muslim people who do it. Right. There, I, I wouldn't be surprised if there's six who do it. No, oh, there is. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there is. And the, the thing is, like, <laughs> yeah. those people are not only accepted, right. they are celebrated. Because yes. now they can be like, look, how can I be racist? Right. I think I think Sheriff Clark is a great man. Look at the big black guy in the cowboy hat who, right. who doesn't like gay people. Like, right. That's it, because diversity is so inevitable even people who are anti-diversity are becoming diverse in their their camps because there's just there's no getting around it right now, now that being said like, like while they may be gleeful to be pointing at the muslims for trump they'll they'll still go right ahead with their all their anti-muslim laws and rhetoric yes like for for your average muslim who's not knuckling under and being like hey this is great make america great again um, they're they're not going to be accepted by any stretch by by these people who who claim to be celebrating it. Yes, I think um, so. When we think about like 2012, you're exactly right. That was one of the deadliest um, uh, shoot the deadliest shootings committed by an affiliated white supremacist. Um, and sadly, there's been uh, repeat things after that. We've um, I don't know about affiliated, but I think it's becoming more and more normalized. Um, and the normalization happens in, you know, Charlottesville. That was, if you think about Charlottesville, those aren't, I mean, those aren't like, um, what, those aren't white power skinheads, um, like Arnold was. They're not walking around with swastikas on themselves and they're not walking around with Doc Martens and, and bald yeah. heads. They're walking around with polo shirts. And khakis, yep, and tiki torches, yeah, <laughs> and, and just basically letting you know that this can be your, this can be your neighbor, this yeah, can be anybody. That that, that yes, right? I think that's what enraged me more than anything else. It exactly. was like you can get the commonality tiki, of yeah, it. Yeah, you can get this tiki torch from uh, Walmart and have it at your barbecue, and then you can march after that. Yeah, and and, and that just sense of normalcy, uh, like, is scary to people. Right. It's it's really important to understand though to. I'm a big uh, Sun Tzu fan, and uh, in The Art of War, he says, if if you know yourself and your enemy, you need not fear the result of 100 battles. If you know one or the other, you'll win half of them, 
If you don't know either, you won't win a single battle. And so understanding the intention of these, of any violent extremist groups, which are all the same, is first of all to speak for the entirety of that group. So the, the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, they announce themselves, they're speaking for all white people. Right. They want to do that. Right. So if we let them do that by saying, oh, well, that's what all we white people think. Right. We are now, we're, we're, we're literally putty in their hands. Right. The, the other thing that they want to do is they want you to think that they're hiding around every corner and they're lurking under every rock and that every white guy you see is one of them. Right. That that's their objective as well. And, and unfortunately, because of the emotions involved and the trauma involved, people are, are falling into to that. Yes. Yeah. They're, they're I see falling that into their bit, hands. Yeah. So it, it's something we need to be really cognizant of that, that when we're opposing these groups that were not accomplishing their objective. I along very the way. much agree with that. I, you know, I, I, I was listening to a talk by Van Jones put on by at a conference by Valerie Kaur. And Van Jones, I think, spoke to. I just fundamentally agreed with a lot of what he said. Of what he said. Yeah, he's a great guy. Yeah, he he said, "You do not want to become what you're fighting." Mm-hmm. And he gave a cautionary tale to us the left progressives to to not go down that road right uh because you're you're not gonna out nasty the nastiest people (laughs) exactly exactly you're not gonna win on those terms right and like you you have to you have to go a different way and you should go a different way based off what you're actually fighting for right and i uh, i just agreed i just fundamentally agreed with that yeah. And I, I've seen the results of that from the campaign. Right. I'll give you a little, just a little story uh, from uh, like on when we when I when we started the campaign, we had to do a lot of testing, like well, what messages were going to work, what, and we got a whole bunch of people together. Valerie was actually one of them, and then we decided what these were the things we were going to test, and then we're going to go we're going to go do some focus groups. And we were doing a focus group. And there was a woman sitting in the back, very old woman. This is when the tea party was super big, and she was just she. We showed we show this. We didn't tell them any information about six. We just showed them pictures, and I was like very excited to see this because like when people will meet me, they'll put on a different face than what they're thinking in some cases, yeah. right? I'm mean, not all the time, but in some cases. And I I in this focus group, I could see the people inside, but they could not see me. So I was like, really, like, oh, I've been waiting. <laughs> like, I, I want to know. Right. <laughs> so, I, and they they asked this woman first, and she just had the most viscerally like racist reaction and most negative reaction. And she's like, "There's no way that I would this, these people are repugnant. They're against my values. There's no way I would have anyone around me." And I was like, "Okay, well, this is it's what I expected, but this is just another extreme. Like, okay, we're not going to change this person." Right. Then. Just gave them some information. Six believe in equality. They stand for women's rights. They stand for religious tolerance. They'll stand for anybody. Right. And then he like, kind of like looked at her face, like as she read the scripts, and like started like you could tell she was thinking something. Something was happening in her head. And then by the end, uh, the moderator uh, went around and asked questions, like, "What? what so, what are your thoughts after you've received this information?" And this woman like looked around the room. She's like. These people are great. I was like, how do I convert? And I was like, well, that's not the purpose of the exercise is to convert you. But I was like, that was that was nuts. Like this right. happened in an hour. Right. Right. <laughs> right? She went from I absolutely do not want to them to be my neighbors to I want to be them. <laughs> do you know what I mean? And that's when I was like, you can't write anybody off. Right. You can't write anybody off because you you don't you just you don't even know the power of what you're even preaching if you do that. Exactly. And I, I saw in that moment, I was, like, I was like, I saw it and I was like, whatever, if we get the money to do this, it will work. And if 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 other people do this, and I started a whole other initiative based off that interaction called Another Neighbor, if other people do that, their own faith, other minority communities do their own faith, meet intolerance with humanity, yep. with empathy, with almost an understanding of like, 
you're feeling this way and I I feel sorry for you. But not telling him that, but like having that empathy yeah, yeah. in the in the being able to man up and like here, this is what I believe. I don't know, that's what I learned and I feel like I don't know how that would relate to someone who's so on I, a breather I feel more that's absolutely yeah. that on Yeah, and and that's what we've been doing for the last five and a half years and that's I think uh, the book speaks to that. Speak and, and Really, just the, you know, as we started off, we started talking about the immigrant experience and the American experience and all these experiences, and really starting with a sense of gratitude, and this gratitude really being that 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 middle, right? Because it's like we can give the left too much energy, mm -hmm. and we can give the right too much energy, mm -hmm. but if we keep speaking to the middle mm -hmm. and allowing that those values mm -hmm. to just just you know walk out in front of mm -hmm. us. They, they'll just mm -hmm. I mean, that, that that works right there. and, and I, I want to pause right there because it's I, when you see the middle i think it's absolutely right but i want to make a distinction and it would only furthers your point it's not the middle ground just to find middle ground no, to compromise no. yeah. it's to find the common ground exactly yeah, yeah big yeah. difference it's a big difference yeah. because you're still firmly in your position but you don't you you may phrase something a little bit different, or you may say approach something a little bit different yeah. mm -hmm. to reach the common ground, or you might point something out to reach the common ground to build off a relationship that might seem very unlikely. Yeah, yeah. We have we have a friend who uh, uh, we met yesterday, and she calls it um, cure fronting. Yep. And sometimes it's cure fronting and like finding a solution. Right. Yeah, care, not, care fronting. Care fronting. Sorry. Yeah, instead care. of confronting. Yeah. yeah. Care fronting. Care. Like, got, like, it, got, care. It. got it. Got it. I like yeah, care yeah. fronting. Cure works also. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, actually, yeah. you can take that one. That's yeah, yours. Yeah. Yeah. Both, I yeah. stole that last time about common ground, middle ground from Van Jones. So, <laughs> right, that's, yeah, that's, yeah. A, that's an amazing exercise. Yeah. And I think we've yeah. been to uh, a couple of talks where people have also said, "How can I convert to Sikhism?" Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny for the yeah. people that are non sikhs listening to this because we don't try to convert people. Yeah, right. yeah. As a practice, it's, the, it's not part of the thing. Yeah, I've also done church yeah. talks where they're yeah. like. The first question out of their mouth was, "Why are you trying to convert me?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, talking about just like how to the term resist. Like it was like resist. We're the resistance, right? Everybody's and I just I'm a big like Star Wars. Nut. I'm the same. Yeah, I'm a big I'm a big film, TV, music geek. In Star Wars, it's, you know, there's the resistance. It used to be the rebellion. and It right. used to be the empire. Now it's the first order. Right. But if you talk to either political poll, it, their story, they are the resistance. Right. And the opposite side is is the first order. Right. Right. And, and, and they both see each other in the com complete opposite roles. Yes. And w what happens is, is when you play that game, you're letting your opponent make the terms of engagement yes so uh we were talking about uh mma fight yep. that happened last night yep uh i'm a huge mma fan i'm, I'm way too fragile to <laughs> yeah. do it nowadays because all the stupid things i did but I, I often ask people to prove this point i'm saying so if i'm still a big gnarly looking dude and people are afraid of me so i'd say if you and i were going to go into the octagon and fight would you rather make the rules Mm -hmm. Or would you want me to make the rules? I'd rather make the rules. Right, exactly. Wouldn't yeah. that be an advantage? Yep. Right. So if, if, if that's what Floyd Mayweather did. It turned out well. <laughs> there you go. There you go. It turned out well. Perfect for example. Floyd. Perfect example. <laughs> yeah. um, when we yeah. when we meet meet hate yeah. with hate, when right. we meet aggression with aggression, we're allowing our opponents to make the rules of engagement, right. which is not a recipe for success ever. Right. So when when I go out and I'm a proponent of forgiveness and kindness and compassion. When Parr talks about those things, we are doing the exact opposite of knuckling under. Right. We, we are resisting in the most effective way. That was the genius of the civil rights movement. Absolutely. Yeah, well, for sure. I, I, I've been massively inspired by that and, and looking back at like the, the Woolworth lunch counter protests. Right. You see these photos of these protesters who are, are defying the status quo in so many ways, they're sitting at a lunch counter, completely still. They're covered with ketchup and mustard and salt and sugar and pepper and blood. And there's crowds of people heckling them and attacking them, and they're just sitting there. Right. That's why those photos, 100 years from now and 1,000 years from now, are still going to have meaning. Yeah. But if those people would have got up and thrown a punch... As, as I would have been want to do, okay. <laughs> that's what I mean. That would have been the first thing I, I would have. I would have. Right. Damn! I want to come. I want to attack right. somebody who's attacking me. 
and you took a photo of that, you'd, it'd just be a big melee. Right. They, and it they, wouldn't they, have the same. It would just and, go in the pile of all the other photos of melees, right. and it wouldn't have any meaning at all. And, and the power and the and the difficulty of achieving that, the power of that, is that you can't give in to your emotions at that moment. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And you have to rec- you have to trust almost that people will see that humanity in you. Absolutely. And that can be difficult when it feels like someone while you're protesting does not see that humanity. Well, it, it, yeah. the, the, the one follow up to that is that you hear people nowadays saying like, that's not fair. That right. we, we shouldn't have to bear that burden. Right. It's not fair that we have to do that. I agree hundred percent. It's not fair. But it, it goes down to do you want to win or not? Yes, I hundred percent agree. So, again, yeah. if you're going, if you're talking about going back to the sports analogies, like right. for teams that are successful in sports, you win sports championships, Stanley Cup, Super Bowl, whatever. Like you guys have to go above and beyond, yep. far above and beyond. Yep. What what is the baseline in order to win? And yep. that's just that's what it boils down. I, to. I agree with that, yeah. and I think you know, for like that's kind of. So thinking about that and saying it's not fair for the oppressed to have to speak to that, I think that's kind of almost a Western thing. Yeah. Because I would say that most six would say, no, I really just want to speak to that. Yeah. That's what we do. That's what we do. Yeah. Yeah. That's our, you know, that's our kurbani. That's our We've always been in that position. Yeah, we've always been in that position. And to think about the civil rights movement and to think about the continuation, this is, I mean, what, what this represents is just a continuation. Of mm-hmm. those movements, yep. this is a continuation of Sikhi that started, you know, uh, with Nanak and then yeah. Nanak and then the Gurus and then and right. then how that became and now even like our our uh, diaspora into America mm-hmm. and how the next generation, such as your generation, is going to take Sikhi and really return it to mm-hmm. the philosophy, right? Which I think we have was lost, a, yeah, which is yeah. a true philosophy of fighting for equality, exactly, yeah, yeah. yeah. and fighting mm-hmm. and then understanding that sometimes. Um, you know, justice is just, it's going to come and you're going to have to have, like you Patience. said, that trust yeah. and that faith yeah. that it will. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, 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 I totally agree with that. I, I think that like you, you, everything you just said, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I want to expand on that, but I don't even think I can. I think it's just like you guys said it. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I, I agree with that. Well, me and Arnold will bridge it to you guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> take over. Yeah. I, by uh, the way, I I'm a Buddhist, and yeah. my refuge name is Nation Chosum, yep. which means Renunciation Dharma Bridge. Yep. So yep. You, you were you nailed it with the bridge. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. I want to. I know we've been going on for a while, and I think we can go over another hour, but we got. I guess we got to wrap this up. But I want to get in a little bit into the book, and then just ask some random fun questions. Yeah. Uh, right and then on. we can. We can wrap it. Um, do you, do you guys want to add anything on onto the book? I feel like we gave kind of a little bit of a preview yeah. of it. Yeah. Um. I mean, was there anything in particular about writing it or? Uh, you know, yeah, it was a challenge. I, I had written a book previously that I I self published entirely. I I did have uh, work with um, some contract editors and with friends who edited for me uh, that made it a better book. This book was um, another experience for me because I really, working with Robin Gabby Fisher, who is our co-author, uh, amazing writer. She's written uh, 12, 13 books, New York Times bestseller, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist. Oh, wow. Um, I had to give up a lot of control of writing in the process, and, and that was really difficult at times mm-hmm. for me. Um but I think it's very important because the entire reason we brought Robin in was to kind of meld our two stories into one. Yeah. And I, I think the book does a, a great job of doing that. Yeah. 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 No, definitely. I mean, yeah, the process was, was challenging. You know, I mean, it was about a year and a half of writing. Yeah. 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 About a year and, and a I, half. Some of, I've had writing, I, I kind of brought writing that I've done over a decade ago into there yeah. but yeah it, 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 kind of a year and a half of solid writing yeah just giving up ownership of like what you know what's going to go into it what what's a good subject matter and having somebody else's eyes be able to look at it and say mm-hmm. oh that's gonna you know and and that and it really just speaks to that sense of we can come together and have one single voice yeah right and i i just think you guys hit the nail on that like having taking your two life stories creating a contrast having that i think it was very poetic the way 
the sharp card. I don't even know if poetic's the right word, but it, if if the, the contract was so sharp and so like it felt like I was watching a movie. And you went from a serene scene to, and then immediately to something crazy. Right. And it's very difficult to accomplish that in the book. And I, I really think you guys did that. And I'm not saying that like BSing you. Because <laughs> right. I read a lot of books yeah. and like, I like a lot of books, but like, it's hard for me to, like, it, there are very few books I, I can read 200 straight pages. Like Harry Potter is one. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like good company. To yeah. Be there's in. like, that's, that's like hard yeah. to like, it's hard to reach that level yeah. of good writing right uh, and storytelling. So, like, if you're on Harry Potter level pages, <laughs> you're, you're, you, read, you did something right. <laughs> well, I think one yeah. of the one of the cool things is like now that Arno is a you know he's a Buddhist. Yeah, he's very introspective now. Yeah, all right, and I think you know the, the the what we I was reading this article this morning and it talked about how students, uh, you know, just growing up are not I and mean, they're taught skills they're taught about everything else mm-hmm. but they're not taught about how to like be introspective yep right and, and in a way sitting at the gudwara uh, all those hours right. for two hours while mom and dad sit there and yep. you meditate yeah you have no choice but to be introspective yep. so you start to think about yourself yep then you start but but you know I, th- I think that's one thing that we can we can bring to it now is that one single voice is yep. really introspection yep. on what we mean to other people and what other people mean to us. Yep. Yep. Um I guess on to the the random questions. What was it like to be on the view? <laughs> <laughs> um the view was awesome. I, I Whoopi was amazing. We had some uh great conversation with her off camera. Um and all the uh, all the hosts on there were a lot of fun to talk to. Uh the the, the crowd was great. It was um I I've done a, a ton of media, so I, I when I when I'm in the moment of those things, I'm I'm in the moment, and I'm not thinking like you know, five million people me. are gonna see this. Like I'm just whatever. I'm yeah. I'm here talking to some cool people, and we're yeah. gonna yeah. go on and you know talk about what we're gonna talk about. But it, it was a lot of fun. You know, it's kind of crazy is that it, it seems so polished watching it on TV. Yeah. But when you're like in it, yeah, there's all these like retakes and they're messing really? up. Really? <laughs> yeah. And I was like, I was like, I was like, I don't know, isn't this show live? Yeah. And they're like, no, it's not really. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that. I didn't know they edited it down. Yeah, they they edit. Well, they don't edit too much of it. They, yeah, they do some yeah. live and they yeah. do some tape. Oh. So our our show was on a tape day. Oh, got it. I didn't know that. And then the last question: What? What is your best advice for a young person that does want to tackle hate? I I I, I love Siki. Uh, I, I I love the idea of being a learner. I, I can really relate to that. Uh, today, that's just my passion is to be constantly learning. So that in itself is is huge. If if you want to uh, combat closed minds and closed hearts, keep yours open. Keep your mind open. Keep your heart open. Um, Dig in on on the positive things. I I try to really challenge myself anytime I say something where I'm like, okay, I'm positive of this. I'm certain of this. Mm-hmm. Like, am I really that that positive about it? Mm-hmm. So the things I want to be positive about are that uh, compassion works, forgiveness works, kindness works. They're they're the most powerful, most beautiful weapons we have as human beings to make the world a better place. Yeah. So uh, going back to, to Van's comment we, and, and a Nietzsche quote, actually, you know, beware when fighting monsters, you don't become one. Right. Uh, so, so be about what you're for rather than what you're against. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, um, another thing that would be kind of throughout this book is just a personal healing process. Um, a lot of times people get into this kind of work because they're dealing with something uh, with themselves. They're going through some uh, pain, and they haven't quite healed yet. So I'm not. I'm not saying that you have to be perfectly healed, and you have to like, um, you know, just just uh, be zen yep. when you're doing this work. But but you have to also be going through your own process mm-hmm. while you're also um, helping community outside mm-hmm. of you. Yeah. Yep. Cool. You guys, that was a lot of fun. That was awesome. Uh, yeah. Uh, buy the book. Uh, you can order online. Giftofourwounds.com will yep. connect you with all sorts of portals to do that. But yep. it's also available in finer bookstores. Also, Par and I have uh, kind of made 
the vehicle that we work with the world, uh, our organization Serve to Unite, which is based on the sick principles of service and oneness. And people can learn more about that organization at serve to unite.org with the number two. And also uh, visit our Serve to Unite page on Facebook. I've done both those things. I endorse them. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening. Huge shout out to Pradeep and Arno for taking the time to chat with us. Buy a copy of their book, The Gift of Our Wounds, online or at your nearest retailer. If you like the show, please rate and review the podcast on iTunes. Subscribe to Sick Meets World on your favorite podcasting platform and share it with your friends and family. Stay tuned for our next episode, which comes out next month. And of course, be sure to check out the National Sick Campaign website for more information. Oh.